Thank you, Pastor Ed Velkinet. Again, as always, I ask you, if you have not received uh, the notes for tonight, the syllabus, hold up your hand, and ushers will serve you. This will be study number nine. While they're doing that, let me uh, just uh, give you an update on uh, a couple things that are about to happen. We will begin the new men's series on Saturday morning, May 21st, the third Saturday morning of every month. I'll be meeting with the men over in the gym, and we are believing God for hundreds of men to show up. We call it Man Up. And um, you can bring uh, sons and grandsons who are 12 years of age and older. If they're younger than that, it would not be suitable material for them at all probability. But uh, any young man who's 12 ought to be hearing these things and get a head start on becoming a man. What does it really mean? And I'll be dealing with all kinds of subject matter that is pertinent to the way that men live on the most practical basis. So I encourage you men to bring some guys with you. I think people, I think that men are hungry for something like this. This will not be a watered down pablum kind of a thing. This will be tough issues that we talk about. Uh, starting at seven o'clock in the morning, donuts and coffee and whatever that kind of stuff is with the holy calories will be served to you. And uh, then at 7.30 straight, I mean, we don't ever start late, you know, so at 7.30 on the nose, we will start, and you'll be done at 9, because we don't want to uh, take away from your family time on Saturdays, but I encourage you to uh, be here. Then on uh, Wednesday night, uh, May, uh, June 1st, which will be, what, uh, a month from tonight, we start a new television initiative, you know, we're on local television every day here in southwest Florida on WRXY. And then on Saturdays, our Sunday worship service can be seen all over the nation on the DISH and direct satellites. But we're going to start uh, a new initiative on Wednesday nights at uh, 6.30. Uh, 6.30 to 7. It's going to be called First Life life at first assembly and life in jesus christ it's going to be an up 30 minute update on what's going on at first assembly you know all prime time programming has been preempted uh, on wrxy for what looks like the rest of the year unfortunately so we're going to take this opportunity and let me tell you that when you come into the sanctuary for our wednesday night bible studies if you get here by 6:30. It will be playing on all three screens, so you'll be able to watch it here and uh, get caught up with our guests and everything else that will be going on at first. And I encourage you to uh, come and enjoy that here and tell your friends to uh, watch it at home. Encourage them. Uh, this Monday, uh, we Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is our annual district council in Orlando. It is a very pertinent one this time around with primary elections being held. We are in the Assemblies of God. We have, what, 57 districts, I think, across the country. Most of them follow state lines, but Florida is so big we have two. We have West Florida, which is up in the Panhandle, and then the Peninsular Florida District Council of the Assemblies of God is everything this side of the Sewanee River, about 340 churches or so. And we meet every year on major business. And this year's meeting next uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is very important. One of the things that will be happening next week that we are so thrilled about is our own Jermaine Hoffman will be ordained next Wednesday night. I think you ought to give her a tremendous hand. Jermaine has a powerful ministry already in this area, and her ordination will be a very precious thing. So um, I will not be here next Wednesday, but after this Wednesday, we've got a pretty good long run on Wednesday nights. I've been asked how many more sessions of 
after tomorrow do we have? Well, several major ones yet to go before we spin off into new series and plan to be doing this every Wednesday night that, uh, that I'm in the city, which is most of them. So thank you for being with us on Wednesday night. Some of you are not part of First Assembly and a spirit of conviction rests upon you every time you come into the building that you should be, but we're glad you're here. I'm just kidding you, kind of. And uh, <laughs> we're very glad that you are here and you're always welcome at uh, First Assembly and we thank you for coming and being part of our Bible studies on Wednesday nights. Heavenly Father, we need you urgently, not kind of, but urgently. Our hearts just almost palpitate in our chest when we watch the news every night. As it seems, the world is just spinning faster and faster and faster. And one of these days, and it could be any time it will spin so fast that every born-again believer living and dead is going to leave it. And we hear the trumpet sound. And we need to know full well these things that are going to happen after tomorrow. In fact, they may happen tomorrow. Tonight, we don't know. So, Lord, I pray that you will give us a keen mind tonight. We stand on that delightful invitation of Isaiah 118, Come now and let us reason together saith the Lord. And that's what we're doing in these teachings from your word, Lord. It's reasoning together with you. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. I'm so thankful, Lord, that our faith is built on something that is reasonable, not some pie-in-the-sky thing, but is reasonable because it is rooted in your holy, eternal word. Help us tonight with this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Poll came out today, sometime this afternoon, among Americans that 61% of all Americans believe Osama bin Laden is in hell. I would be one of the 61% that would believe that. <clears throat> 5% said they didn't believe in hell, which left 30-some percent not having any idea where anybody was. <laughs> and now Protestantism is being bombarded with universalism, which is the hellish heresy that everybody is somehow going to make it one way or the other if we just hang on because God is too good to uh, do anything other than that. That's heresy, and there's nothing in the Bible to substantiate it. Nor when you die, is there a comfortable little holding pad for you out there somewhere where you can just hang on while people try to pray your dead soul into eternity. The Bible says it is appointed unto us to die one time, once, which is really enough. Die one time, and after that, after that comes the judgment, not second, third, and fourth, and fifth opportunities. And churches are watering this down and wondering why society is going to hell in a handbasket. But we don't do that here at First Assembly because we believe the Bible is the very literal word of God. And we believe it from Genesis through Revelation. How many of you have ever appeared before any kind of a judge? Hold up your hand. Yeah, and it isn't fun. I've only done it one time. I got a speeding ticket. Uh, about 40 years ago and appeared before a judge who didn't understand and um, <laughs> I don't like appearing before a judge God bless judges they fill a vital role in life I just don't want to appear before them in their official capacity so tonight we study the scriptures to see what it's going to be like for the nations of the world when they stand before Jesus Christ, who no longer appears as their savior, but as their judge and as their king. When the nations of earth meet their new king, and as I state clearly in line two, they are not going to like it. 
The Bible says that today is the day of salvation, to hang on to some glimmer of some heretical thing that down the road God may say, oh, you know, gang, I didn't really mean it. You're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. I've never understood, really, logically why anybody rejects the gospel. I enjoy being a Christian. I would be a Christian if there were no heaven or hell. I like the lifestyle. I like everything about being a child of God. Everything about it is fulfilling. The older I get, the better it gets. But there is a heaven and hell. All of this plus eternity. And someone says, well, well, let me just tell you another story. Somebody said, uh, uh, you believe the story of Jonah and the whale? And the guy said, yeah, I do. He said, oh, that's ridiculous. He said, uh, no, I believe in the story of Jonah and the great fish. Jesus never said it was a whale, great fish. He said, I'm very anxious to, uh, to talk to Jonah someday when I get to heaven and ask him all about that. And the skeptic said, what if Jonah's not there? The fellow said, then you ask him. Now, the teaching tonight is built solely on the words of our Lord, so let's take a hard look at them here. On page 1, beginning with line 9, this is taken from Jesus' words in Matthew 25. Remember, the greatest sermon on prophecy ever preached was preached by Jesus. It encompasses the entirety of the 24th and 25th chapters of Matthew. It's called the Mount Olivet, the Mount Olive discourse because Jesus gave it on the Mount of Olives. And he specifically, not generally, Jesus specifically said exactly what was going to happen. And uh, with the exception of these end time, these very end time events, everything that Jesus said would happen has happened. Line number nine, when the Son of Man, that's Jesus, who came to this earth both as God and man, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. We don't know how many that is. We know the Bible talks about 10,000 times 10,000. That's 100 million. That's a bunch of angels. And all his angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations and he Jesus shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left then shall the king say unto them on his right hand come ye blessed of my father Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, um, when saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. The guy whose book's making all the tabloids right now, who said hell is temporary, never read this passage. Jesus said it'll be into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, 
When saw we thee and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. If you are a born-again believer, this passage has nothing to do with you. Nothing. Because at the rapture, you were gone. You were taken, along with all the righteous dead. By the time this passage comes into play, we have been with our Lord for seven years. We have been in the presence of God. We have gone through what Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 3 as the judgment seat of Christ, where we, we are tried to see if any of our works endure. We're not tried to see if we're saved because we wouldn't even be at the judgment seat of Christ if we weren't saved. But this is to check out our works, our merit badges. Our works will not save us. Our faith in Christ and the blood of Christ is what saves us, but no eternal rewards are automatic with salvation. I keep drumming that into you. We say, I'm saved, and I'm going to have this huge crown, and it ain't necessarily so. You'll be saved, as Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 3, so as by fire, unless you've got some works to back up what you did since you believed. And those works are gold, silver, and precious stones, which fire will only refine, or hay, wood, and stubble, which will burn with fire. Gold, silver, precious stones are all those things we do passionately motivated for our, by our love for Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a really practical question. What if Congress decided that your charitable giving was no longer tax deductible? What would happen to your tithing record? Thank you for coming, folks. Good night. Drive home safely. Be careful. That's kind of a staggering question, isn't it? Why do you support missionaries? Why do you give tithes and offerings? Why do you go to church? Why do you do anything? Not for some plaudits of people or some tax deduction because of our passion for Christ. And if there were none of these attributes with which we are blessed in America, we would do it anyway. That's gold, silver, and precious stones. Why do you witness to people out of some sense of guilt? I have to. No, no, that's hay, wood, and stubble that will burn in the fire. We do it because we just bubble over. We want to tell people about Christ. That's gold, silver, and precious stones. Why do people sing in the choir? I told you, I think, one time, the first Sunday I was here, which was somewhere back when the earth's crust cooled, <laughs> a lady came up to me and she said, I am the soloist in the choir. And it's always going to be that way. And unless I sing solos, I don't sing in the choir. Hay, wood, and stubble. <laughs> Goes up in fire. It's what we do for the Lord that matters. It's what we do motivated by our love for Christ. So out of that judgment seat of Christ, our rewards are passed out. Paul wrote, if, and I hate that little preposition, if, any person's work abide, he shall receive a reward. If. So we go to the judgment seat of Christ and get our rewards, and then we are to be ushered into the marriage supper of the Lamb, the great time when Jesus gathers his bride to himself. Will all believers go to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Most people will tell you yes. I wonder because if I don't have anything to lay at Jesus' feet, 
I don't know that I really want to go. I would be embarrassed. Did you ever go to a wedding reception where people were just bringing in these beautiful gifts and you didn't bring anything? The old tightwad cheapskate didn't bring anything. <laughs> Thought it was just a free cake deal, you know? And you know how sheepish you felt? I'm just kind of looking at some of you and you're saying, mm. <laughs> How do you think you'd feel at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is the great extravaganza dedicated to Jesus? Remember, the marriage supper of the Lamb is for the groom, not the bride. We are the bride, the church of Jesus Christ. We are the bride. He is the groom. We have a hard time with that in America because our weddings are all for the bride. Here comes the bride. Nobody ever sings, here comes the groom. I don't care if he shows up or not. <laughs> I've never heard anybody say, I wonder what the groom is wearing. <laughs> but the marriage supper of the Lamb will all be for Jesus. So I wonder how comfortable some of us will be there. Meanwhile, down on earth, Antichrist has taken over. The believers have been taken out. There's no Christians left after the rapture. However, we read in the book of Revelation that God, just as he did with Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul the apostle, sanctifies, saves, seals 144,000 dynamic, spirit-filled Jewish witnesses who blanket the globe spreading the gospel. And after the rapture takes place, there's going to be a great harvest of people who give their lives to Christ, most of whom will have to do it at the cost of their own lives. They'll be martyred. And I hear people say, well, if I miss the rapture, if I don't make it, I'll get saved in the rapture, or I'll get saved after the rapture. No, you won't. You're kidding yourself. If you can't live for Jesus now, how do you think you could live for him if they took you out to a guillotine and cut your head off or put you up against a wall and shot you? If you can't live for Jesus in this land of the free, what in the world makes you think you could live for Jesus now? It's just so hard to be a Christian pastor. Give me a break. It's hard not to be one. Reminds me that a couple years ago, uh, our youth department came to me one day, the leaders, and said, we'd like to make a video of you, a parody. I said, okay. They said, we know that you don't have a real long fuse when it comes to counseling. And, and I don't know wherever they heard that. The fact that I keep my office at 37 degrees is kind of a tip <laughs> off there. But uh, they said, we want to do a parody on your counseling methods. and We're going to bring a kid in. and This is all going to be fiction, but we acted out. And so they did. And the video that they showed showed this high school kid coming in to see me in my office over here. And he sits down. What can I do for you, son? Pastor? I'm in high school, I'm a senior in high school. And it's just so hard to be a Christian in high school and I'm persecuted and students make fun of me and it goes on and on. And in this video I said, you know, you make me sick. <laughs> I can hardly stand the sight of you. And I get up and in this video, I just beat the tar out of this kid. <laughs> I knocked him from one end of my office to the other, and we had lamps upside down. And When it's over, he walks out of my office with his hair all disheveled, and his glasses are broken and hanging on his nose. And, and he looks in the camera and says, Thank you, Pastor. I feel so much better now. <laughs> it's just nothing worse than a whiny Christian. Count your blessings. See what God has done in your life. But there are going to be, there is going to be an avalanche of people saved after the rapture, during the tribulation time. 
many of them will be martyred, as we will see as we get into this study, and taken off the earth and into the presence of God. But some will make it all the way through the tribulation. These are the ones who Jesus refers to as the sheep, the believers who make it clear through the hellish time of the tribulation. The goats will be those who also make it through but make no commitment of their lives to Christ and indeed try to hamper the gospel. We're going to see this very clearly. Uh, look at page two. This event... When the nations meet the king, will take place after the tribulation, that seven-year period following the rapture, and Christ's second coming to earth. It takes place after Christ comes back to the earth the second time. Not the rapture. That's when we meet the Lord in the air. I always make that specific difference for you. The rapture is when we meet the Lord in the air. That's the next thing coming. The second coming is when Jesus literally touches down again on this earth and it takes place after the tribulation and Christ's second coming but before the beginning of our Lord's earthly 1,000 year reign by the way at our next study two weeks from tonight we get into the millennium you it's incredible when Jesus reigns on this earth for 1,000 years pastor how many of those years do you think you live all of it every day of it, because I'll no longer have a mortal body. I'll have a body that's resurrected and glorified, just like Jesus had, who was the first fruits, the prototype of all of us who will follow him in resurrection. Oh, man, this millennium thing is incredible. Wait till we get into it. Look at the box. It is essential to understand that at the time of Christ's second coming, the saved and lost who are still living on earth and who have survived the horrors of the tribulation are still mingled together. So the judgment here involves the separation of the wicked from the righteous. The judgment will be based on outward works of love and kindness to those belonging to Christ and who are suffering. The wicked will not be allowed to enter Christ's millennial kingdom but will go into eternal punishment while the righteous will inherit eternal life. It's essential you know that. If you know that for a fact, based on the Word of God, some of these new books that are coming out will just be hooey to you because you'll know better. You'll be smart enough to know better. Line four, we usually think of Jesus as our gentle Lord, and he is. So elegantly couched in the lyrics of Charles Wesley's ancient hymn, Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon a little child, pity my simplicity, suffer me to come to thee. Loving Jesus, gentle lamb, in thy gracious hands I am. Make me savior what thou art, live thyself within my heart. I don't write stuff like that anymore. Great songs by Charles Wesley, John Wesley's brother, who brought into this world the great Methodist movement uh, many, many decades ago. Now, Jesus is embodied in that passage, of course, and those of us who know him and love him know the gentleness of our lovely Lord. But look at line 11. Jesus is, of course, embodied in that beautiful hymn. However, he's also embodied in John's passage in John 5, 26 and 27. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he's the Son of Man. So many of today's would-be theologians are, they, they think God really only has one or two facets his kindness, his mercy, his love, and those are very real. Don't ever underestimate that. But like a beautiful diamond, God has many facets to his personality. Oh, I, I need to lead you sometime in a study of a, who God really is. I ask our folks sometimes uh, on Sunday morning, if... Uh, if you had to just talk about God, 
without repeating yourself, how long could you talk about God accurately and fundamentally sound without ever repeating yourself? Oh, I could talk about the Lord all day. No, not personal testimonies. How much do you really know about God, his attributes, his personality? How much do you really know about God? And you can't cheat like preachers do. You know, well, God, we're talking God here, the only God of the universe, the eternal living God. We're not talking about Buddha here. No, 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 no. We're not talking about Confucius here. We're talking about God, the wonderful God. They go on and on and on and on. Never say a cotton-picking thing. So you can't cheat like us preachers do. As we preachers do. Let me clean up that grammar because somebody's recording this. No, no. How much do you really know? Could, how, how long do you think you could really talk about God and never repeat yourself? Three minutes? Try it when you get home. Well, I could talk about God for three minutes, Pastor. You try it when you get home. Just take a watch with a sweep hand on it. And don't repeat and don't make it personal testimony. Just talk about God. This is who God is. Not even what God does. Who is he? See how long you could really talk. And this is where these crazy heresies come into being because people don't know who he is. They'll take one passage of Scripture and make a whole doctrine, a whole theology out of it. It's like the man who said, I don't need to study the Bible. I'll just take my Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to help me and open it up. And wherever my finger lands, that's my verse for the day. So he tried it. And Judas went out and hanged himself. <laughs> well, that won't work. So he closed his eyes Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> Those are both scriptures, by the way. But you better find out what they, what they mean. Okay. Uh, I've done that review with you. So now let's go to uh, page three. As one commentator observed, there is no more awesome picture given to us of the Lord Jesus Christ than that of him as the one who has the right and the responsibility to judge humanity. Revelation 19, 17. John wrote, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice. This is during the battle of Armageddon. Saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, may I remind you, that the Valley of Armageddon is the migratory passage of birds going from Africa to Europe and back again. It is full of millions, untold millions of birds. All the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together, he says to these birds, unto the supper, what are these birds going to eat? that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. Pastor, what do you think that means? I think it means a lot of vultures are going to have a heyday as they pick clean the bones of people who fall at Armageddon. Verse 19, I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth, the kings of the earth, all of the authority structure, and their armies gathered together to make war against Jesus who sat on the horse and against his army. Now I give you the setting for that on line 16, the global setting. For seven years now, Antichrist has pretty much consolidated his power over the known world. And near the end of the tribulation, about the only place he hasn't conquered probably would be the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan and the Far East. Suddenly, thinking he's the global majordomo, suddenly Antichrist is attacked, Revelation 9:16, And the number of the army of the horsemen, and back in John's day, they would have thought about horses or airplanes or tanks or whatever it would have been. In those days in the army, you traveled by horse. Today, it could be jets, anything. 
The number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. That's an attacking army of 200 million troops coming in various ways from east of the Euphrates River. So these two great armies, the king of Europe and the federated states of Europe and the west by and large, which includes this country, led by Antichrist. And here comes the 200 million troops from the east, which by the way, China alone can now field along with Japan and all of these nations. So here come these two armies to fight to the death and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, look at line 24, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. He that sat upon him is Jesus, by the way, is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire well, that's a long ways from Wesley's song, Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild, Look Upon This Little Child, which is the way he is now. But now his eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. That's what John wrote in the first chapter of his gospel. In the beginning was the word, capital W, the Greek word logos, the beginning, the light for everything, the creator, that which spawned everything that is, is the word. His name, oh, and I got goosebumps just telling you that. Everything was the word of God. That's Jesus. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. I do that for those of you with no imagination whatsoever. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. What is that white linen? It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ who dwells within us. And out of our Lord's mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, not us. He will do it. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. For those of you who think churches ought to be consumer friendly and never upset anybody, never get them riled up, you know, just cluck them under the chin. Gooch coo. What are you going to do with this? The winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's one of the facets of his personality. You prepared to deal with that? And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The King is coming. And he's coming down not to take a plebiscite, not to take a vote. He's coming here to run this place, lock, stock, and barrel for a thousand years. Why just a thousand years? We'll get into that when we get into the millennium. Can you even begin to imagine the terror in the hearts of this unholy trinity from hell, Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet? They know they have no power whatsoever over Jesus, and their doom is sealed. And then I use King David here in his Psalm 2. David is a psalmist, a songwriter, a king, soldier, but he was also a prophet at times. And in Psalm 2, he gave us an incredible prophecy of this end time. When these armies see Jesus coming in the clouds, why do the heathen rage? People imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. Here he comes. Here he comes. Against the Lord and his anointed, that's us, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And as they say that, out of the, out of the sky will come the most horrifying sound the world has ever known, the derisive, mocking laughter of God. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Now look what he says to these kings. I have set my king, who's that? Jesus. Upon my holy hill of Zion. Where's that? Jerusalem. Boy, you need to know that. These people who want to divide the land of Israel, divide Jerusalem, they're baying at the moon because that's going to be the capital of the millennium and Jesus will rule and reign 
Why do you think Muslims want that city so bad? Uh, Ehud Barak, who was the Prime Minister of Israel, was going to give Yasser Arafat everything he wanted about, what, 10 years ago? I mean, it was scary. He was going to give them back the West Bank. He was going to give them half of Jerusalem. He was going to give them everything. And Arafat said, no. Hope you're smart enough to pick that up. Why did Arafat not jump all over that like CNN thought he should have? Because they wanted all of Jerusalem. Because if they control Jerusalem, the Koran is right and the Bible is wrong. Think it through. In the Bible, in the Bible, God's word, Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem. In the Koran, Islam will implore Sharia law against the whole world from Jerusalem. It's a theological issue, people, not geopolitical. It's theological. Man, I just got goosebumps telling you this. Verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Look what God says to our Savior. Ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Listen to what Jesus is saying to the monarchs of the earth. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, Jesus, kiss him, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Well, go to page five. Jesus is coming. On his head are many crowns. That means he's given the headship over every government on the planet. Who comprises the army with Jesus upon his return? He'll be accompanied by the armies which were in heaven riding white horses, clothed in fine linen. That doesn't mean they got white robes on. It means the righteousness, the dazzling righteousness of Christ. Remember when Peter, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration and they saw the transfiguration of Jesus. And in that moment, they saw him as he is eternally, not just as his human body, but his appearance was dazzling. That's why John wrote later in John chapter 1, as an old man, he wrote this from Ephesus, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten Son of God. So here come all the armies of God. That's us, dazzling, not in our own merit, not with our pathetic little jets, but with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, corroborates this, line 13, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, that's Jerusalem, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So here's the army. Number one, an innumerable company of angels. Wow. All the born-again believers and the Old Testament saints. And remember, says line 22, that all the believers, both Old and New Testament, now have resurrected, glorified bodies just like Jesus, against whom there is no time or space to mention whatsoever. Remember, Jesus, after his resurrection, walked right through walls. While he's talking to the disciples on top of the Mount of Olives, he just goes into heaven. No big letter S on his chest or anything. He just... And remember, he's the prototype. He's the first fruits. I love that passage of Paul over in Corinthians. Jesus is the first fruits. That means he's the prototype. Whatever he was after the resurrection, we will be. And we shall be like him. Wow. Hallelujah. Line 26. What will be the role of the army? To fight? Never. 
Once you know Jesus, you never have to defend yourself again, ever. Only to observe what Jesus does. Verse 15, out of his mouth goes the sharp sword, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, etc., etc. Okay, go to line page 6, because I want to deal with the sheep and goats as we wind this up tonight. How does Jesus deal with human beings still living on the earth? Remember, there are followers of Christ and non-followers of Christ who have somehow made it through the tribulation period. Line 9, after Jesus has dealt with the military adversaries opposing him at his return, with the word of his mouth, he destroys them. How does he deal with others? The scripture I gave you on page 1 of tonight's notes Matthew 25, 31 gives us a clear concept of what is about to happen next. Now, this paragraph is very important. During the tribulation, there was an unprecedented preaching around the world led by the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. When the rapture occurred seven years earlier, there was not one unsaved person left on earth. Yet we realize that when Jesus returns to earth, there will be a multitude of his followers, new believers, new converts, recent converts during the tribulation. Still multitudes of other tribulation converts will have been martyred by the savagery of Antichrist and his henchmen. Revelation 7-9 gives us uh, a description of those people who were martyred in the tribulation. I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And one of the elders, that's one of the redeemed people, said to me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These were the martyred saints during the tribulation. But what about those who never committed their lives to Christ, who resisted the message of the 144,000? Jesus now has to determine, because there's a lot of them and there's a lot of saved people. And he's about to usher us all into the millennium, the 1,000-year reign of Christ. Nobody's going into the millennium who's not right with God. Nobody. So there's a judgment here. This is another one of the judgments. Jesus will now determine, look at line 35, which living human beings will be taken into his millennial kingdom. Now comes the judgment upon all those who have not perished through the wars, pestilences, and judgments of the tribulation period. They will all be paraded before the judge, none other than Jesus. And he'll divide the sheep from the goats. The sheep, page 7. Those whom Jesus will take with him into the millennium will be separated to his right. Now, if you're going through the tribulation and you make it through those seven years, you'll stand before Jesus and you'll see the division of the house. Hopefully, you'll be taken to the right. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. See, we like to think that has to do somehow with today. It has nothing to do with today. This has to do with the tribulation time. Now, it's nice we do those things now. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and fed you? Or thirsty and gave you a drink. When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king, Jesus, shall say unto them, When you did this unto the, one of the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. Well, who are the brethren? Jesus was a Jew. You don't have any question about that, do you? Jesus was a Jew. 
The evangelists in the tribulation are Jews. Now think what's going to happen in those seven years when Antichrist is screaming and yelling and making people worship Satan and himself. And here come 144,000 spirit-filled, fiery preachers of the gospel. They haven't taken the mark of the beast, so they can't buy food. They can't go over here to McDonald's. They can't go over here to Publix. They can't make any money. They can't hold down a job unless they have the approval of Antichrist. They have no money. They have no food. They have nothing to drink. They have no clothing. They have no place to stay except there will be people in the tribulation who say, like some people did with the Jews when the Nazis were coming in, we'll protect you. We'll take care of you. We'll hide you. We'll feed you. We'll clothe you. We'll help you. It's really an underground body of believers in the tribulation who take care of the 144,000. Uh, I've written a, a very powerful paragraph here for you that comes from the Dr. Pentecost. I love this passage, line 18. Now we can understand this further from something that's written in Revelation 13. When Antichrist, the head of the Federated States of Europe, comes to power, he'll pass an edict that no one can worship any god but himself. The false prophet who's allied with Antichrist will say that no man can buy or sell unless he submits to the authority of the beast and shows his submission by accepting the mark of the beast in his palm or forehead. Without the mark and without submission to the head of the Federated States of Europe, no person can buy or sell. The 144,000 Jewish witnesses will not bow, and so they cannot buy or sell. When they come to a village to announce salvation through the blood of Christ, to warn that Jesus is coming back to earth to judge, there will be some individuals there who will hear, who will take their scriptures and examine them to see if the things proclaimed are true. They'll be convinced that the message that these preachers proclaimed is true. They'll accept Christ as Savior. Now, what will these new believers do for the Jewish messengers? They'll share their food. They'll give them lodging. When the preachers are arrested because they refuse to submit to the authority of the beast, the new believers will go to the prison to visit them and carry food to them. It is a manifestation that they are children of God because they minister to those who've ministered to them the truths of salvation through Jesus Christ. I think if you, would, uh, if you would read the diary of Anne Frank, you could start to comprehend some dimension of this, at least to a little bit, of those families that tried to protect the Jews throughout Europe during those days. And boy, if they were caught, they were sent to the gas chambers themselves. So what's it going to be like in the tribulation when all hell is just unleashed. And even the restraining hand, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is lifted. Think of what it will be like when, when hell just empties its filth, its fury on this earth, and the Holy Spirit just stands back and does nothing to stop it. And here come these preachers of the gospel. I want to tell you about Jesus. Are you, are you going to protect them? Think? Most people won't. But those who do at the last judgment when the nations stand before Christ, not the great white throne judgment, but this judgment, Jesus will say, thank you, because you did this unto me. When you did this unto my brethren, you took care of them. Now I'll take care of you. I observed at the bottom of page 7, it occurs to me that even now would be a good time to get into practice helping those in need. One of the characteristics of Jesus while he was on this earth was that he touched people at the place of their greatest need, Acts 10, 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. There are some who uh, say, well, that's the social gospel. No, no, no. Doing good things won't save you. 
But if you're saved, you ought to be doing good things. There ought to be the fruit of the Holy Spirit coming forth from you, that you have compassion and that you have love and gentleness. I don't understand how Christians cannot get along with each other. It makes no sense to me. I'm often asked, why, why do you speak highly of these other churches in town that preach the gospel? Because we're brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ. That's why. That's why we need each other. I'm not going to speak evil of them. I love to tweak them because <laughs> they do me. But that's all done because we love each other. But there isn't anything that we wouldn't do to help other congregations because we're all in this together. What about people that don't know the Lord? Don't you think we ought to be doing good to them? Jesus said we ought to love people. It's one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, gentleness, goodness. We ought to be good people, not frothing at the mouth all the time, just being pulpit pounders. But one of the ways you really influence people is to really love them. There's just no armor that can withstand genuine love, really. It may take a while, <laughs> and it may press your patience to the nth degree, but there's nothing that replaces love and compassion. Wherever Jesus went, Book of Acts says, he went about doing good. And we call ourselves followers of Jesus, so we ought to be doing good to one another, don't you think? The goats, now Jesus turns to those on his left hand and proclaims just the opposite. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil, bless you, prepared for the devil and his angels. <laughs> that hits me so funny. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why, they ask. Because I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison you never visited me. When did we ever see you like that, Jesus? I mean, when did, when did you ever show up? Remember those 144,000 of my brothers? You never lifted a finger for them, which indicates you're not right with God. And so you're done. And they are cast into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And now the earth starts with a clean sweep and goes into the 1,000 year reign of Christ. Um, you know, I love Jerusalem. It's, it's a great city. And it's gonna be the capital of the world in the millennium. We'll go into that in great detail in two weeks. When the king along with his regent, who will be David, comes back. <laughs> wow. And rules from Jerusalem. You can't even begin to describe this, what this earth is going to be like. And there's, there's just so many things from prophecy that are starting to happen that we read about out of Ezekiel and Daniel that are so far-fetched 10 years ago. You know, uh, Ezekiel wrote that during the millennium, uh, during the millennium, people will be able to catch the fish they catch in the Mediterranean Sea, they'll be able to catch in the Dead Sea. There's nothing alive in the Dead Sea. Nothing. It's 34% salt. Nothing can live in there. And the reason why that water will be purified is because Ezekiel wrote two and a half thousand years ago that there will be some kind of tributary that is designed that flows from the Mediterranean Sea into the Dead Sea and it will come in down there around, around uh, the canyon where David hid from King Saul, which is precisely a project that has been on a back burner temporarily for Israel to start working on now a tremendous cut right through the rock from the Mediterranean into the Dead Sea. And they will attach it down to En Gedi. Ezekiel wrote that two and a half thousand years ago. Think about that. And for the first time ever, Jerusalem is going to have access 
to the sea, a seaport. Jerusalem's not a seaport town. Tel Aviv is. And you've seen that Dome of the Rock, that gold Dome of the Rock that sits there in Jerusalem. It's kind of the emblem of Jerusalem. It's a terrible place to me. I think it's demonic. It's where the temple used to sit. And now it's the Mosque of Omar, the Dome of the Rock. And it's controlled by the Muslim Waq, the followers, the very strong followers of Muhammad. And, uh, and Israel is so worried about starting a jihad, they don't even go up there and clean it out, which they should have done after the Six-Day War. And uh, they just don't want to start a war. But Jesus doesn't have that inhibition. <laughs> and Zechariah tells us that when Jesus comes back, his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. And apparently, it's not a smooth landing because it breaks the Mount of Olives in two and starts a terrible rift that rips right across the Kidron Valley and knocks that building into a million pieces. And Jesus will set up the capital. Man, it's terrific. Where do you hear all this stuff, Pastor? Oh, the news, history books, the Bible, observation, interviews. It's terrific. Boy, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have it made in the shade. And if you don't, here come the judge. <laughs> Your call. Let's stand.